I'm uh, Daniel Einhorn, Dr. Einhorn. Uh, I'm the Vice President of uh, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and a trustee of the American College of Endocrinology, which uh, hosted this uh, conference that we're going to speak about. I'm also the medical director of the Scripps Whittier Institute for Diabetes in La Jolla, and I'm very uh, proud to uh, convene this group on behalf of uh, the chance to present our consensus conference statement uh, that was put together over the last uh, two days, especially the last several hours, I mean, how these things go. Um, we have uh, a couple of speakers today uh, that you see before you, including myself, and also in the first row are the chairs of the various components of the conference. So uh, you may see us moving around among us as uh, the, your questions come up. Uh, ACE has a <coughs> reputation for trying to be among the very first organizations to respond to the needs of uh, patients and physicians uh, with endocrine issues, and we hope that the issue that's going to be presented today is something that your um, readers, your viewers, uh, will find interesting and uh, compelling. So first, to my immediate left, is the chair of our uh, consensus conference and task force, uh, Dr. Alan Garber, who is a professor of medicine at uh, Baylor in Houston. And then next to him is the program committee chair, who really pulled so much of this together, Dr. Luda Handelsman, who's the uh, medical director of the Metabolic Institute of America in Los Angeles. So now it's my pleasure to bring up our chair, uh, Dr. Garber. Thank you, Dr. Einhorn. It's a pleasure to welcome the ladies and gentlemen of the press and other interested attendees to a presentation of our consensus conference. Now, the issue that we confront is of not a stranger to any of you. There's an explosion of uh, obesity and ob obesity-related diseases in the United States. Chief amongst those, for those of us who are endocrinologists, of course, is the explosion of diabetes. All of you know that we diagnose diabetes by somewhat arbitrary criteria based upon levels of glycemia associated with characteristic end organ complications of diabetes, specifically retinopathy. And we now diagnose diabetes at a fasting plasma glucose level of 126 or higher, or a two hour post glucose challenge of 200 or higher. And yet those numbers are not the upper limits of normal. We characteristically think of normal uh, fasting glucose levels as being less than 100. Normal post glucose challenge levels being less than 140. So you have an intermediate zone, a gap if you will, of glucoses that are not normal but yet not diabetic. And these, it turns out, are not a, a, an area of benign neglect, shall we say. These are an area in which it's now increasingly clear uh, we can see the beginnings of these characteristic end organ complications of diabetes where they may ultimately lead to blindness, kidney failure, or amputation. We're beginning to see the earliest evidences of these microvascular complications in levels of glycemic elevation less than what we call diabetes. Hence the term prediabetes. It's not normal, but not yet quite diabetes. It's an area of risk for glucose-related and organ complications, ultimately leading to blindness, kidney failure, and amputation. This is also an overlap state of excess cardiovascular risk. We now know that in patients with intermediate degrees of hyperglycemia, a fasting between 100 and 125, a two-hour post-challenge between 140 and 199, that these patients have excess cardiovascular risk, which of course, all of you know, is no stranger to the diabetic population either. Cardiovascular disease clearly increased in patients with diabetes, and it is increased, albeit to a lesser extent, in patients with pre-diabetic degrees of hyperglycemia. In the past, there's not been a clear formulation of strategies by which to deal with the hyperglycemia and with this degree of excess cardiovascular risk. And because these strategies have been somewhat unclear, uh, there's been, to some extent, neglect of dealing with patients who are at risk, risk for ultimately adverse outcomes that none of us really want to appreciate. This is not a small number of individuals. 
we know that the population of patients with diabetes increases by approximately a million and a half Americans annually. We now know the Centers for Disease Control think there's in excess of 21 million diabetics in the United States. But yet there's more than 50 million pre-diabetic patients. So by their sheer number, this represents an enormous potential burden on the healthcare system. About this burden, something must be done. And so in light of that, uh, our, our college has decided to try and formulate a view, an orientation, a systematic diagnostic and management program, if you will, to deal with these patients. And to, to achieve that, uh, we appointed a committee of 17 experts uh, in the field of uh, diabetes, the majority of whom are here today to help not only amplify, but address your questions regarding our statement and our views <coughs> on the area of pre-diabetes. And we have uh, listened to, over a two-day interval, uh, the presentations of two dozen world-renowned experts in the field of diabetes and cardiovascular disease to help us formulate strategies to more effectively intervene successfully on behalf of our patients who have this somewhat neglected state of prediabetes. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, we have formulated our approach based upon six questions that, as you know, with traditional consensus development statements, they are embodied by questions to be addressed by the expert panel. And so our questions are as follows. The first is, what is the spectrum between normal glucose tolerance, prediabetes, and diabetes, and what should be the criteria for the diagnosis of each of these three states? We have in your handout uh, draft answers for all of these questions, and we have members of the committee, uh, <coughs> Dr. Einhorn, uh, who helped write those answers, and we'll be happy to address your questions regarding that. Our second question is equally straightforward although perhaps not so straightforward if you think about how we approached it. We decided to ask the question, what are the risks of not treating prediabetes? Oftentimes you hear about the risks of treatment. What you don't hear is the risks of neglect. And so we've decided to answer the question of how, how can we neglect it, and if we do, what happens? Our third question, goals and treatment modalities for the focus of the management of prediabetes. This is really the heart of the management issue. If you've identified this and you realize that it's probably worth managing, how might we do that? And we have members of the committee who wrote a response to that as well. Our fourth question, uh, somewhat smaller in nature, is if, if you have set management modalities, how can you monitor the success or failure of your management. You know, when you institute management, medicine always attempts to measure the effectiveness of any of our treatment programs and then to revise or upgrade our management strategies based upon those measures. Our fifth question really addresses the larger societal issue. Whenever one seeks to manage a disease, it <coughs> takes time, effort, and money. When you start to manage a disease in 50 million Americans, it potentially can take a lot of money. The question really then is, can we afford the costs of the managements that we're proposing? And in fact, we have uh, excellent studies that have looked at the cost and the cost benefits to be gained by intervening successfully at the pre-diabetes level in terms not just of lowering sugar, but in preventing these adverse consequences of prediabetes evolving into diabetes, evolving into heart disease. And uh, those are well known and will be characterized for you in the written document. Finally, as with most medical conditions, not all is settled and there are areas for future research which require our mandate from society to our science bodies, 
to formulate and implement specific approaches to aid us in acquiring that knowledge which we require to go forward. So at this point, uh, I'd like to, uh, to turn this conference over uh, to my uh, co-chair, Dr. Handelsman, who is co-chair for the program, uh, and ask him to uh, manage the future discussion. Dr. Handelsman, thank you very much.